What is up, everybody? JT Sports here. Back to you guys with another episode of the JT Sports Podcast. On this episode, I'm going to be giving you guys my college football week eight reactions. We're going to be talking about Clemson escaping Syracuse, LSU defeating Ole Miss at home, and Oregon getting a top 10 victory against conference foe UCLA. If this is your first time listening to the JT Sports Podcast, welcome. I appreciate you for tuning in. Make sure that you follow me on all of my social media platforms. You can follow me on Twitter at JT Sports underscore underscore and on Instagram at JT Sports underscore. If you're listening to this episode of the podcast on YouTube, make sure that you go ahead, leave a like and subscribe. Check out the JT Sports Podcast available on all podcasting platforms, wherever you get your podcasts from. Apple, Google, Spotify, make sure that you check out the JT Sports Podcast, link down in the pinned comment section in the description down below, and leave a five-star review. Listen to the JT Sports Podcast on all podcasting platforms and leave a five-star review. Clemson escaped Syracuse, defeating the Orange 27-21. Dabble Sweeney and company are really fortunate to be walking out of this game still undefeated because Syracuse played a hell of a game. And I was really surprised at how close this game was because I thought that Clemson was going to win this game and they were going to win big. And not because I thought Syracuse was a bad team, but I didn't know how Syracuse was going to be able to keep this game competitive going against the fourth quarter. But you know the way they were able to to actually keep this game competitive was because of their defense. Their defense had four takeaways. They got some key stops in the red zone. They had that big scoop and score in the red zone, that fumble that they scooped up and took all the way to the house for a touchdown. That was huge. And not to mention, Syracuse went into halftime with a 21-10 lead. Clemson just came into this game flat. DJ Uyungle has had a pretty good season prior to this game. But in this game, he looked like the DJ that we saw back in 2021. He was struggling to complete passes downfield accurately. He was making bad decisions. And it's just like, it kind of felt as if he was pressing. The simple things... He was starting to overcomplicate. And it's kind of evident because once K. Kupnick came in, it was a different offense. And it's not like Kupnick came in and he was throwing the rock all over the field. I mean, he came in and he was just handing the football off. Clemson had 293 yards rushing on the ground. They were averaging nearly five yards per carry every time they ran the football. And when you look at how Clubnet played, I mean, I can't really judge fairly because we only have a small sample size to go off. And plus, he wasn't asked to do all that much. Now, Dabble Sweeney came out after the game and confirmed that DJ is going to be the starter next week. But if DJ Uyungle would have came out and didn't have the kind of performance that he had, Clemson would have blew out Syracuse. Like, if you watch this game, Clemson was really beating themselves. They were handing Syracuse gifts. Now, that's not to take away anything from Syracuse because, I mean, Syracuse did what they had to do. They forced the turnovers, and they actually were able to cash in on a couple of those opportunities. But in the second half of this game, I think that's where you started to see the gap in talent between Clemson and Syracuse start to show itself. Because in the first half of this game, Syracuse offense was pretty effective. In the second half, they punted on pretty much every single possession on offense. They couldn't get anything going. Clemson's defense put the clamps on in the second half. And you got to give a lot of credit to Dabo Sweeney and this staff finding a way to win this game. Because although Clemson was the better team, and some people may not have doubted Clemson winning this game, 
Because me, even when they were down 21 to 10, I still had a strong feeling that they were going to win this game. Now, that was partially due to the fact that I had Clemson on my parlay, minus 14, and they didn't cover that. So that was another reason why I kept telling myself, oh, Clemson still has a chance to win this thing because it's like, when you put money on these games and the team that you put money on is down big, of course, you're going to keep telling yourself, oh, yeah, they're going to come down because you don't want to accept the loss at that point. You get what I'm saying? So you look at Syracuse defense. They get takeaways and then their offense comes out and pretty much doesn't really do anything with it. There was a interception that DJ Uyongle had. And this was on a 14-play drive that was pretty much going into Syracuse territory. And when it looked like Clemson was really about to start rolling, DJ, U- DJ Uyongle threw that interception. And that's kind of when Syracuse really started to get a good amount of momentum on their side. And their defense was playing well at that moment. And Clemson really didn't have anything offensively that they could do to have success at that point. And then in the second half, with the benching of DJ Uyongale putting in the true freshman, the fact that you were able to run the ball so effectively shows you just how good of a team Clemson actually is. Clemson turned the football over four times in this game. And yet they still won. That's crazy. They had four turnovers in this game. And they still had several opportunities to win this game by two possessions. I think with Clemson, they needed a game where they got battle tested. They needed a game that was really going to push them. And this was that game. Because... I don't really think too many people expected Syracuse to lose to Clemson by only one possession. And I know that Syracuse has played Clemson close in the past. But this Clemson team has been really good this year. And their defensive line has been outstanding. But when you look at Syracuse, you know... They were able to hang around, but they weren't able to capitalize off their opportunities in the second half. You know, you get stops and you end up having to punt after them. And then on top of that, you get turnovers and you can't capitalize or convert those into points. Syracuse just needed a little bit more from their offense in the second half. I think if Syracuse could have at least scored... 10 points during the third or fourth quarter, just put up 10 points somewhere during the second half, they probably could have won this game. Because if Clemson would have been put in a situation where they had to drive down the field to win the game, okay, Club Nick, I don't think they would have won. And not to mention, Syracuse defense was playing very well with a couple of key starters out. So I am really impressed with how Syracuse played in this game. Honestly, I was really sleeping on this team. I didn't think their win against NC State was all that impressive. And then you look at their game against Purdue, you know, it's just that when you looked at Syracuse schedule, you just never really felt As if they legitimately had a chance at pulling the upset off. And some people probably considered this to be a trap game. But I didn't. Because for me to view a potential matchup as a trap game. The team that is the underdog going into that matchup has to have a certain strength about their team. That they can go ahead and use and try to find the weakness. Syracuse strength 
was forcing turnovers. And the thing with Clemson was that their weakness was DJ Uyungle. And once they got him out the game, everything was pretty much smooth sailing. So that makes me wonder if DJ Uyungle wasn't the starter in this game and the other quarterback was, would Clemson have covered? I think they would have because they weren't really doing anything crazy on offense. They were running the football. They were, you know, throwing the football here and there. But Clemson's offense mostly ran through Will Shipley in the run game. And if Clemson is going to continue to have success moving forward, it's going to be with the run game. Now, they do run DJ Uyungle a good amount with the quarterback run and everything that they do with the read options and whatnot. But I kind of feel like, you know, with DJ Uyungle, in certain situations, you got to kind of try to reel him back in. You got to try to regather his composure. And I don't think that Clemson did a really good job of that in this game. Anytime through an interception, I didn't see them try to ease him back into things. I didn't try. I didn't see them try to get him back into rhythm, give him a couple of three, four easy throws, and then try to throw something downfield. So I think that the coaching staff was a little bit ear prepared for this matchup. I don't think anybody expected Syracuse defense to be as good as what it was in this game. I mean, Clemson's offense has been pretty solid this year. So I think it's a testament to how good Syracuse defense actually was. So Syracuse can't pull off the upset against Clemson. They fall short 21-7. Clemson improves to 8-0 on the season. But I still view Clemson as one of the best four teams in college football. Despite having a disappointing performance in their win, they found a way to get the win. And that's what you look for in the best teams in college football. You see, what makes it so hard to be the Alabama or Ohio State or Clemson or Georgia is the fact that they have multiple ways to win. It's, it's like they just find ways to position themselves to win. And for Syracuse, they didn't take the game from Clemson. You got to take the victory from Clemson. You feel me? You got to take the victory from Alabama. You got to grab it. You just don't go take it. You got to you got to really take it. And for Syracuse, when they needed those big plays to really take this game, they couldn't do it. So let me know how you guys feel about this game down in the comment section down below. I can't believe that Clemson really did not cover. That's crazy. LSU beat Ole Miss at home 45 to 20. And with this win, LSU is now tied for first place in the SEC West. Now they have a bye week coming up. And after their bye, they got to play their arch rivals, the Alabama Crimson Tide. And if you're an LSU fan right now, you definitely have to feel pretty good about your chances in that game, considering how well your team has played over the last couple of weeks, especially in this win over Ole Miss, which I was pretty confident in picking LSU to win this game. As a matter of fact, I was telling my friends for the whole entire week leading up to this matchup that I was taking LSU money line. Because I felt like Ole Miss was a little bit overrated. You see, people looked at Ole Miss and thought they were a better team than what they actually were because of the fact that they were still undefeated and they were ranked inside the top 10 of the AP Top 25. Meanwhile, let's be honest, a lot of you guys watching this probably started to count out LSU after they got blown out at home by Tennessee. And heck, some of you guys might have even counted out LSU after they lost their season opener to Florida State. But you see, this team has gotten gradually better over the course of this season. You got to remember, this is only Brian Kelly's 
first year at LSU. He got a bunch of guys from the transfer portal and basically say, you know what? We're not trying to rebuild. We're trying to compete right away. So when you bring in so many pieces, it takes a while to get everything working in order. But the offensive line has improved. Jaden Daniels is absolutely balling. He is the most underrated quarterback in college football. And I don't think that's an opinion. I think it's a legitimate fact. When you look at what he did against Ole Miss, he completed 21 out of 28 of his passes for 248 pass yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions. But he also ran the ball 21 times for 121 rushing yards and had three touchdowns. And this wasn't his first time doing this. He's been balling for the whole entire season. Every single game, Jaden Daniels pretty much has showed up for LSU. Now, sometimes he may show up a little late. You get what I'm saying? But he's been balling. And if you're talking about the Heisman Trophy conversation, he has to be in it. Because, you know, don't they say the Heisman Trophy is supposed to be awarded to the most outstanding player in college football, the player who most contributes to his team's success? I mean, who else is contributing more to their team's success than Jaden Daniels? The dude leads his team in rushing yards. He's literally carrying LSU on his back. Literally. Not trying to use that as a metaphor, but literally. He's carrying this LSU team on his back. And... When you're talking about the best quarterbacks in this conference behind Bryce Young and Hendon Hooker, who's at number three? Who, who, Jaden Daniels or KJ Jefferson? Based on this season, I probably would go with Jaden Daniels. Jaden Daniels has been really good with not turning the football over. He's really smart when it comes to picking when to run too many people have criticized him and said that he runs too much he needs to be more patient in the pocket bro have you seen that lsu offensive line all this year they are now starting to block at a really productive level a better level than how they were at the start of the season because you saw that fsu game oh my goodness it seemed like every single time Jaden daniels dropped back he had to run Because it was somebody in his face. Now, for Ole Miss, they got outscored 42 points to three after their 17 to three lead early in the second quarter. And the main reason why I picked LSU to win this game was because I didn't trust Ole Miss passing attack in this game. You see, I was thinking that If this game ended up being a close matchup and it was going to be decided by one possession, Ole Miss is a team that loves to run the football. They have one of the best rushing attacks in all of college football. However, if they are put in a situation where they need to throw the football to win games, they are put in a situation to fail because they can't do it. Jackson Dart has pretty much turned the football over in almost every single game this season. And he's been inaccurate. He's missed open wide receivers. And on top of that, the Ole Miss wide receiving core has also dealt with some drops as well. So the passing game isn't efficient. So you got Jaden Daniels who takes care of the football. And in a one possession game, turnovers matter. So I didn't trust Jackson Dart in this matchup simply for the fact that he's too turnover prone and he's going against a quarterback that's more efficient and takes better care of the football also Ole Miss defensively their defensive line is okay but against LSU you know I felt like LSU's offensive line really kind of got the better of the defensive line of Ole Miss especially late into the game. And the reason for that was because their offense really couldn't get anything going and their defense ended up being on the field for a lot of plays. And LSU 
wore him down. And Brian Kelly pretty much alluded to that in his um, post-game interview. LSU was a more physical team. They imposed their will against Ole Miss. And Ole Miss isn't some slouch. Like, I know I knocked them for, you know, not having the strongest strength of schedule and whatnot. But trust me, when you see this team run the football, the stats replicate just how well they do it. I mean, their running back group is sensational. The true freshman running back, Junkins, I mean, that dude is a tank. Zach Evans, we know what he can do when he's healthy. However, it's just that there was a point in this game where Ole Miss couldn't really run the football no more. They had to throw the football to get back into the game. And that's when LSU made their due. That's when LSU took control of the game. Once LSU went on that run, and they got up by multiple possessions going into the fourth quarter. LSU pretty much won the ball game at that point. Because they put Ole Miss in a situation where they had to get away from what they do best. And what Ole Miss does best is run the football. So if Ole Miss has to win a game by throwing the ball, I don't think they're going to be able to do it more times than not. However... When they have the run game going, the passing game is a good complement at times. You know, it's funny because Ole Miss can throw the ball when they want to. However, when they need to throw the football, they can't do it at an efficient level. And a good example of this is the first half or the first quarter of this game. Did you guys see how well Jackson Dart looked or how well he played in the first quarter? I mean, the dude was absolutely on fire. I thought he was going to have a big afternoon, but he came crashing right back down to earth the quarter after. You see, Ole Miss had success throwing the football when they wanted to, but they couldn't when they needed to. When they really needed some big plays in the passing game in the fourth quarter to stay alive in this game, they weren't able to get them. And Jackson Dart is a really good athlete with his legs. And he has been really big also on the ground for Ole Miss. And yet, he barely had any contribution in the rushing department for the Rebels and their loss against LSU. Now, for Ole Miss, their next couple of games are against Texas A&M, Alabama, Arkansas, and Mississippi State. Now, all of these games are winnable, but they all are losable at the same time. I mean, you look at Texas A&M, they're just a dumpster fire. They should win that one. You got Alabama. We already know it's tough to beat Alabama. You got Arkansas, Mississippi State. So for Ole Miss, I'm really interested in seeing how the remainder of their season plays out. Because they benefited off not really facing as stiffer competition as guys such as Alabama and LSU have played. Ole Miss only had to play Kentucky. And they were able to dodge everybody else until LSU. And that's why I was saying like LSU was a little bit more battle tested than Ole Miss. Yeah, they may have had a close game against Auburn, but... That was a big win for them at that point of the season. They needed that. And then you got the win over Florida. That was huge. I mean, LSU is getting hot at the right moment. The really right moment. And don't be surprised if you see them push Alabama into a really, really close game. Because, heck, last year, Everybody thought that LSU was going to get blown out. We already knew that Ed Orgeron was on his way out. And despite that, LSU gave Alabama a close game. So I'm really excited to see what's next for both of these two teams. Is Ole Miss going to bounce back? Or are they going to come back down to earth, lose some more games, and then finish the season with eight wins? 
Or could they potentially be a 10-win football team? And for LSU, are they going to be able to challenge Alabama? And we're going to be talking about LSU a little bit more on the podcast over the next couple of weeks leading up to their bout with Alabama after their bye week. But LSU gets the win over Ole Miss 45 to 20. Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section down below if you're listening to this on YouTube. Oregon beat UCLA 45 to 30. And after watching this game, I came away with two big takeaways about Oregon football. The first one is me stating the obvious, but we should all agree that Oregon right now is the team to beat in the Pac-12. This is the most talented team in this conference. They are the most complete team in the Pac-12 right now. They have one of the best offensive lines in college football. They are absolutely loaded at running back and wide receiver. Bo Nix is playing at a insane level. Shoot, you probably could say that Bo Nix deserves to be in the Heisman conversation. And not to mention, their defense is also insanely talented as well. They have the most talented defense in this conference. Now, when you look at the trajectory of this Oregon football program, Oregon fans right now should be insanely excited. Excitement for the future of Oregon football should be at an all-time high. You want to know why? Because you upgraded at head coach with Dan Lanning. When Mario Cristobal left, you know I had my reservations because he recruited at a really high level and he had a pretty good amount of success during his time at Oregon. However, you know, he left for Miami and we all see how that's going right now. I'm a Miami fan, so I'm not going to get into that. But it was a lot of concern when it came to figuring out who was going to be the next head coach after Cristobal left. Because Mario Cristobal did a very good job at recruiting and building up that Oregon program. But they peaked under him. And there is a level that I think Oregon can reach under Dan Lanning. And I think that level is actually them finally being able to make it to the college football playoffs and to compete for a national championship. And I mean, they recruit at a really high level. So I don't really think the talent is the issue. Really, it's just the coaching. And there has been plenty of times when Oregon has won big games and then they have lost games that they had no business losing. However, I think that Dan Lanning is going to put Oregon in better positions to be in the conversation for the college football playoffs in the future because I think that he's a better game day coach than Mario Cristobal. You see, Mario Cristobal recruited all of these insanely talented players out of high school, especially on the offensive side of the football. However, what's the point of recruiting a five or four star quarterback wide receiver if you're going to put them in the offense, that's going to limit what they do well and minimize their, their, their development. And that's what Mario Cristobal's offensive system did to a lot of the talent that he recruited. It neutralized them. And he didn't really try to do anything to adjust his offense. His mentality kind of was, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Meanwhile, you look at Dan Lanning. This is an Oregon football team that can beat you several ways. You know, under Mario Cristobal, Oregon's mentality was smash mouth football. We're going to be a more physical football team. We're going to run the football down your throat and we're going to impose our will on you. However, you look at Dan Lanning and he says, yeah, we can impose our will on you running the football, but we also can air you out. So it's pick your poison. And... You look at the decision to go for that onside kick. That's really what has me so excited about Dan Lanning and what he can do for this football program. And some of you guys may feel like I'm going a little bit too deep with this, but hear me out. That decision to go for that onside kick in the second quarter 
it wasn't just some random thought that popped into his head. He didn't say, oh, man, let's just go for an onside kick. This was something that Oregon and Dan Lanning actually were practicing in secrecy all week. And Dan Lanning, according to reports, told members of the media who were in attendance during Oregon's practices not to say anything about what they were doing because this was something that they planned to execute in the game. And they did it flawlessly. And the fact that he was able to say, you know what? I realized something. Let's work on this. This is something that could give us an edge. And it worked. That is the sign of a good coach. You see, I don't think too many coaches would pay attention to what happens during the onside kick and then think to try to build upon it. You feel me? Like the onside kick normally is something that no matter what level of football you play, you don't really practice recovering onside kicks all that much. And I don't really think no coach even makes it a focus in practice to say, hey, we're going to dedicate 30, 40 minutes of our practice time to working on recovering this onside kick. Like, I don't think a lot of people realize the thinking that goes into these things. Because it may sound simple, but a lot of coaches don't think of things like this. And small attentions to details is what makes great coaches. Because the small things add up. The little things add up and they turn into big things. So if Dan landing right now, I just love what he's doing with this Oregon football team. And I wonder, if Oregon never played Georgia their first game of the season, and let's say they would have played like a SES opponent or something like that, and they were still undefeated at this point of the season right now, how would you view them? Do you guys think they would be viewed as a top four team, a top five team, or do you guys still think that people wouldn't give them the respect that they deserve because they're going to say they play in the Pac-12 conference, which people really shouldn't be using that this year as a knock on any team in this conference because this Pac-12 conference is really good. And I can't wait for bowl season to come around because they're going to smack a lot of other conferences and make a lot of other conferences look really bad because this conference isn't top heavy. Like there are some really good teams in the middle portion of this conference, like Oregon State and Washington. Now, when you look at UCLA, we got to talk about them. Going into this game, we knew that they were going to have success running the football. However, if you are a Bruins fan and somebody came up to you and told you, hey, Zach Charbonnet is going to run for over 100 yards rushing in this game. He's going to have 20 carries for 151 rushing yards and one touchdown. Do you guys think that you're going to win? Most Bruins fans will tell you, hell yeah. Because prior to this game, they were 11 to know when Zach Charbonnet has rushed for 100 yards or more during the game. However, he did that this game and they still lost. And they lost by two possessions. And the reason for that was because they were put in a lot of third and long situations. And the key to slowing down UCLA's offense is that you got to be able to win on the early downs against them. You got to be able to force them to lose a couple of yards or first down or second down and get them in third and long situations. Because if you put them in third and short, or third and manageable, they're going to convert more times than not. And when you put them in like a third and four or shorter situation, they're going to convert that at least 88% of the time. This is a team that is really built on dominating the trenches. So for Oregon, I thought it was a very good game plan that the fact that they were so successful at winning in those earlier downs and forcing UCLA to have to convert in third and long spots. And that caused UCLA to miss out on several opportunities to keep up with Oregon in this game because Oregon's defense didn't necessarily play well, in my opinion. 
you know, they play well to the standards that I have for these Pac-12 defenses because I always view defenses in a certain light. People think a great defense is a defense that just holds you to zero points, doesn't give up a lot of yards. Like, you can be a great defense in different ways. And in this game, Oregon was really great defensively, situationally. Third down, they got off the field. In the red zone, they were able to hold them to a couple of field goals. They were able to force a turnover late in this game, an interception on DTR. So with UCLA, if they play again, I think that this game would be way more closer. However, I still would take Oregon to win because they're a more talented team. But UCLA's offense just couldn't keep up pace with Oregon's offense. And it really just was because they just couldn't keep matching Oregon's touchdown total. Oregon scored touchdowns on six out of eight of their offensive possessions. That's insane. So UCLA got to find the defense. I mean, their defense at times can be really optimistic. They can force a takeaway or two in big spots. But when you're trying to be the team like a Oregon... You have to be able to clamp down and have a stretch during this game where you can hold their offense to maybe three points and buy your offense time to get some things going. And for UCLA, their defense never did that. Like their offense was scoring, but they never gave their offense a break. It's like their offense was always down, always down, always down. It's like, imagine if UCLA's defense could have gotten one or two stops this game would have been dramatically different because it's not like UCLA wasn't scoring I mean they barely punted in this game Oregon and UCLA Oregon and UCLA both of these offenses were going absolutely bonkers however the field goals were what killed UCLA you got to get in the end zone and the reason why they had to go for those field goals was because they were put in those sturdy long spots. Now, also after that onside kick, that's when things really tilted towards Oregon's favor. I mean, after that, they scored. It was 24-10. They went into halftime with a pretty big lead, and they never really looked back. However, UCLA did do a good job fighting back, getting back into the game. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see these two teams meet up in a rematch in the Pac-12 championship game. And I really hope it happens. I really want to see it because I think that these two teams are the two best teams in the Pac-12 this season. You look at USC, I don't think their defense is as good as Oregon's or UCLA's. However, I do think that when it comes to offensive firepower, I think they got more than UCLA and they probably might be a little bit on par with Oregon maybe a tie I don't know but let me know how you guys feel about this game down in the comment section down below and even though UCLA lost this game I don't really want anybody looking at UCLA in a Worse light or worse light than what they did prior to this game. Because don't let this one loss make you forget the fact that UCLA has wins over Washington and Utah. UCLA is 2-1 against ranked opponents this year. That's something that you definitely should not forget. And this team does have the talent to pull off upset against Oregon if they can get a little bit more help from their defense the next go around. But I appreciate you guys for tuning in to this episode of the JT Sports Podcast. Make sure that you check out the podcast available on all podcasting platforms. Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcasts from. The JT Sports Podcast is available. You can check out the JT Sports Podcast with the links down in the description or the pinned comment section. And I will see you guys with another episode shortly of the JT Sports Podcast.